let's go ahead. So, so it is my great pleasure to present uh, the Maxwell McKenzie Endowed Lectureship in Endocrinology and Diabetes. This is uh, one of the flagship lectureships of the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, and recognizes uh, the contribution of Dr. McKenzie to both the University of Miami and thyroid research. Uh, Dr. McKenzie made uh, multiple contributions to uh, clinical and thyroid research, including the McKenzie bioassay for thyrotropin and the discovery of uh, thyroid stimulated antibodies as a key component of Graves' disease. Uh, he came to Miami and spent uh, close to three decades, uh, both as a chief of endocrinology and chairman of the Department of Medicine and here at UM, uh, he continued his uh, productive research career and also made major contributions to the mission of the department and the division of endocrinology. I want to thank uh, Steve for accepting the invitation to deliver this year McKenzie lecture, and uh, he will be now introduced by Dr. Patel Angelin, our chief resident. Dr. Angelin. Yes. So our uh, speaker today will be Dr. Stephen Kahn. Um, so Dr. Kahn is a professor of medicine at the VA Puget um, Sound, Sound Healthcare System and University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. He holds the Leonard L. Wright and Marjorie C. Wright Chair and directs the Diabetes Research Center at the University of Washington. His research interests include the role of the beta cell in the pathogenesis and treatment of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. He has performed physiological studies and actively participates in a number of large multi-center clinical trials to prevent and treat type 2 diabetes, which includes studies comparing youth and adults. Aside from his clinical studies, he has an extensive basic research program examining the loss of beta cells in type 2 diabetes. He has received numerous awards, including the Endocrine Society Clinical Investigator Award, Department of Veterans Affairs John B. Barnwell Award, European Association for the Study of Diabetes Albert Reynolds Award and Claude Bernard Award, and the American Diabetes Association Outstanding Achievement in Clinical Diabetes Research Award. Today, he will be giving a presentation on diabetes association with COVID-19 risk. Without further ado, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Stephen Kahn. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yes. And thank you um, to Anessa Benal Mizraki and the Endocrine Division um, for asking me to come and give this endowed lectureship. It really is an honor to do so, and having read a little bit about um, Dr. McKenzie, I must say he clearly is a leading light in the field of thyroid disease and many of the things that he aspired to as a clinician in terms of clinical work, research and teaching are the things we all aspire to and he clearly sets an example that I try to follow and I hope uh, many of you as well. So when asked to give this lecture, I thought it would be good to title it around diabetes and COVID or SARS-CoV-2 given what we're experiencing today. And clearly there's been huge amounts of progress in this area over time. And in fact, so much of it is continuing every day so that when I started putting the lecture together, I actually finished up making a new slide yesterday because the world is changing. And so I wanted to start off by just showing you my disclosures, which are important, of course. And we'll then start by showing you the outline for the talk. There are five broad areas I'm going to cover, a little bit of the epidemiology of COVID-19 and its outcomes as they relate largely to diabetes. Some discussion of ACE2, which seems to be one of the points of entry for the virus into cells, and particularly as it relates to the islet. Some therapeutic interventions in COVID-19 outcomes, and here clearly there's so much to cover, but I'm going to focus on things that you don't normally think about, which relate to diabetes. The long COVID syndrome in one slide as it relates to diabetes, and then some things for us to all think about for the future. So let's start then with the epidemiology. And a lot of the good early epidemiology actually came from the United Kingdom. And shown on this slide is the in-hospital deaths for people with COVID-19 
in the period March to May when we had the first true wave of COVID affecting us across the globe. And what you see on this slide on the left is the number of deaths per 100,000 individuals categorized into the overall population shown here in this blue color, those without diabetes in purple, those with type 1 diabetes in red, and type 2 diabetes in blue. And what you can appreciate from this slide, which I'm sure many of you know very well already, is that increasing age is associated with an increased risk of mortality from this virus. And that diabetes, whether it be type 1 or type 2, represent risk factors that increase the risk of dying compared to the general population, again shown here in purple, and that with aging, as you can see here, the risk increases in people with type so 2 diabetes. Shown here on the right is a forest plot that looks at a variety of different categories that may be associated with risk. And I don't expect you to go through this and sort it out. So I've really summarized it here on the left. We recognize, and this is well known now also in the US, and as I pointed out to you, that there's increased mortality with increasing age. Males are more at risk of dying than females. Socioeconomic status seems to be a very important risk factor, not only in the US, but clearly here in the UK as well. And ethnic groups that are not white seem to be at increased risk. When we look specifically at, type, at the type of diabetes, you can see that in individuals with type 1 diabetes, based on these data, the risk of dying has increased three and a half fold, and with type 2 diabetes, it is doubled. In other forms of diabetes, uh, pancreatitis-related diabetes, cystic fibrosis, whatever you may think, again, the risk is increased twofold. Now, what else do we know about diabetes and the type of diabetes that we recognize, the two major forms on the left, type 1, and on the right, type 2, in terms of the number of deaths? And what you see here on another set of data that was published in the same issue of Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology is an analysis of deaths shown here in 2017-19 in red, and you can see it's fairly stable in those individuals with type 1 diabetes at about 100, and that in 2020, not related to COVID, shown here in blue, it's about the same. There's some disparity whether this may be a miscategorization, so people who may have had COVID um, got, the, got categorized as not having done so, we don't know, but shown here in green with the gray shading is the excess deaths in individuals with type 1 diabetes related to COVID, showing more than doubling at its peak in terms of this, the death rate. And on the right, when you look at type 2 diabetes, you can see from the y-axis that the number of deaths is clearly greater. It's about 20-fold higher, in part because the disease is more prevalent um, in the population than type 1 diabetes. And you can see exactly the same pattern showing that COVID-19 is associated with increased mortality in individuals with type 2 diabetes. Now, what else have we learned from these data from Holman et al? And shown on the left now is type 1 diabetes again with 464 deaths from a practice registry of over a quarter million individuals with recognized type 1 diabetes. And looking here at sex, age, glucose control, renal function, and body mass index, you can see that they recognize from this forest plot cutoffs that would suggest that your risk is higher if you have type 1 diabetes and are male. Over 70 have pretty poor control based on a hemoglobin A1C greater than 10, have chronic kidney disease defined here as an EFGFR less than 60, and are either quite lean with a BMI less than 25 or obese with a BMI greater than 30. So that's for type 1 diabetes on the left. What about type 2 diabetes on the right? where you can see the number of deaths is increased markedly. So we've got 10 and a half thousand deaths in a population of close to 3 million individuals. Again, through that approximate three month window in, um, actually it's two and a half month window earlier last year. And what we appreciate looking at risk in this population is again in purple males, individuals over 70 and with chronic kidney disease. But what contrasts the two forms of disease is that in individuals with type 2 diabetes, the risk increases when your glycemic control has a hemoglobin A1c above 7.5. Similarly, in the leaner individual, but in this instance, more obese individuals with a BMI above 35, 
are those who are at greater risk of dying. So we can at least say from these data that based on these characteristics, the chance of an individual with type 1 or type 2 diabetes having a bad outcome would appear to be increased. Now, these are analyses from the UK. Shown here on this next slide is a meta-analysis of data put together and published in the fall, looking at a variety of studies, many of them from China, but you can see here also this COVID surge, surge collaborative, which is an international study. You can see the individual studies looking at the risk ratio, where here one of them for diabetes, in fact, is reduced risk. But overall, most of them lie to the right of the line of unity, suggesting increased risk. And down here is a result of the meta-analysis, which says that if you have diabetes, doesn't define which type, your risk of having a bad outcome, namely death, if you were to develop COVID-19 is increased nearly 50%. Now, why this is occurring is not entirely clear. It may be glycemia and diabetes, but we also know that diabetes is associated with a number of comorbid conditions. And so you can see shown here what I've summarized from that same paper. If we look at cardiovascular disease, hypertension, cerebrovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, or congestive heart failure, all of these are associated with an increased risk. And given these occur more frequently in people with diabetes, these may be a contributing factor also to why diabetes as a comorbid condition is associated with an increased risk of mortality um, with COVID-19. Now, what do we know about glycemic control and diabetes status and its effects on um, survival after developing pneumonia with COVID-19? So I'm showing here in the top half of the graph three figures that are based on a diagnosis of diabetes. So if you look at this left-hand panel, you can see in black individuals with no known diabetes and their mortality. And here you see individuals in red, where clearly the mortality has increased so that in this study from Italy, over 50% of individuals with diabetes had unfortunately passed away after 10 weeks from the onset of symptoms. What is interesting in this middle plot is that if you divide individuals with no diabetes and then comorbid diabetes, in other words, known diabetes, and then take individuals who arrived at the hospital with no previous diagnosis of diabetes, but are now quite hyperglycemic at the time they're admitted, you can see that these individuals with, who previously were not known to have diabetes, shown by this red broken line, have a mortality that may even be increased further than those individuals with known, no, known diabetes, whether this is related to glycemic control is a question, but clearly having new onset diabetes is not a good thing if you're admitted to hospital, your survival rate is quite seriously diminished. And then when you look at individuals with diabetes who are treated with lifestyle in black, oral agents and in plus or minus insulin in the solid red line or insulin alone, and I would argue to the insulin alone may represent people with more severe diabetes and more long-standing long diabetes, you can see in those individuals, the mortality is greater than in individuals who are treated with lifestyle or oral agents and insulin. Now, what about when we look at glucose control? And that's shown here in the bottom panel. So let's start again on the left. You see here three different cut points for glucose, translating these into things that we think about normally, this is 100 milligrams per deciliter in black, 100 to 125 in red, and 126 or more shown here in the broken red line. And you can see that with increasing glucose, there's increasing mortality. When you look at the cohort that just had diabetes, and in this instance, there's everybody whose glucose is less than 5.6 survives, you can again see that the greater the glycemia, the poorer the outcome in those with known diabetes. And in those individuals who had no known diabetes, whether it was known at the time of admission um, or whether it was diagnosed at the time of admission, you can see that again, the higher the glucose, the poorer the outcome. So one question that relates to this is that because individuals with diabetes do not mount an adequate immune response, is their antibody response different to people without diabetes, or does glucose dampen that response, and therefore one is finishing up with poor outcomes. And shown here on this slide from that same paper, 
are the IgG, IgM, and IgA responses based on no diabetes or diabetes shown in black and red here on the left, or based on grades of glucose control shown here in the gray on the right. And you can clearly see from these figures that essentially there is no difference in the antibody response between those with diabetes and without diabetes, or based on the glycemic control at the time of admission. So therefore, it would not appear that this is immune-based, at least for the increased mortality. And perhaps, as I suggested to you earlier, it's much more linked to comorbid conditions. Let's turn then now to look at localization of ACE2 and the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus in the islet. And this, I will start off by sharing some pictures with you that are unrelated to the islet, and then I will talk specifically about the islet. And some of you may know some of this data because two of the investigators on one of these major papers actually come from your institution. So let's start off to think about ACE2, this angiotensin converting enzyme 2, its cardiometabolic actions and how this links ultimately to the entry of the virus into the cell. And as many of you know, there's been huge amounts of focus on ACE2 and the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus leading to the COVID-19 disease. So here you see angiotensin 1 as a 1 to 10 amino, to 10 amino acid peptide labeled here as 1 to 10, on which ACE2 acts to produce angiotensin 1-9, or on already partially cleaved product, ACE2's effects are to produce angiotensin 1-7. You can also see that 1-9 ultimately finishes up at 1-7, which normally will act through the mass receptor to have beneficial effects on the cardiovascular system and will act to block angiotensin 2, 1 to 8 action through angiotensin type receptors, which can have more deleterious effects. So angiotensin 1, 7, shown here, produces, like I say, a variety of beneficial effects, that, which include increased blood flow, cardioprotection, improved endothelial function, reduced fibrosis, reduced inflammation, and for those of us who are endocrinologists, improved increased insulin levels and reduced insulin resistance. What happens, however, when you have SARS-CoV-2? And this is illustrated here on the right. Here you see the protein, and what you can see is the spike protein with its receptor binding domain shown here at the end. This is what the protein looks like. It's this portion of the molecule to which most people will make antibodies and certainly to which the companies have been trying to develop vaccines. You can see here the ACE2 receptor sitting on the cell membrane and that this spike protein receptor binding domain will lock with the receptor, which through the action of this protease called Timpress 2 will allow the virus to be activated or get entry into the cell and be active to produce the disease. Shown here is a medication called Camostat mesylate that's available in Japan for treating, um, for, for treating pancreatitis, which would believe to be able to inhibit ACE2's binding to this particular protein. Now, what do we know then about ACE2's distribution and how does that link to the pneumonia that we see people getting and to diabetes specifically? So here you see a paper that was published in the journal Diabetes in the fall, which looks at alveolar tissue or lung tissue. Here you can see the alveolar tissue in the top two panels and bronchial tissue in the bottom two panels. In these pictures, we are looking at staining for ACE2 using an antibody that supposedly is specific for this protein. And you can see that the protein normally is present in the alveolar tissue and also in the bronchial tissue, which I think we all recognize based on the physiology we've all learned over the years. When you look at individuals with diabetes, and here are examples of tissues taken from a person with diabetes, you can appreciate when you compare this right panel to the left panel that there's increased staining for ACE2 in individuals with type 2 with, with diabetes in the alveolar tissue. And in the bronchial tissue, even more can you appreciate the intensity of staining is greater in an individual here with diabetes versus those, this individual who does not have diabetes. On the right, you can actually see this quantified. And you can see there's a broad range of ACE2 positive cells in the alveolar tissue here in healthy individuals for people, I shouldn't call them healthy, people without diabetes um, on, on the top panel and here in the bronchial epithelium in these individuals who don't have diabetes in the bottom panel. On the right, 
you can see also that in those individuals with diabetes in the darker color, the mean value is greater and the confidence intervals are larger. And so one has a significant increase in ACE2 in both the bronchial and alveolar tissues in individuals as shown here. Now, how does this relate then if we use the same idea of staining for ACE2 to diabetes? And the focus, much of the work has been on the eye. And I'm gonna start with by sharing some data here that is the oldest data that I'm going to share with you today, basically, from 2017 from Sakini Zareka here at the University of Washington. She was looking at ACE2 because she's interested in the renin-angiotensin system's effects in the islets. And she stained beta cells shown here in the upper three panels and alpha cells that make glucagon in the lower three panels. Now, what you see here is going to be the principle for a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about in the next few slides is immunostaining and the ability with this mic microscopic processes to merge figures to try and understand where proteins may co-localize in cells. So let's use the beta cells and alpha cells as an example of this as we move forward. So you see an ACE2 staining in this panel in the top left, which green represents the fluorescent dye that's been used to find this antibody binding, represents positive ACE2 staining in the island. In the middle panel, you see staining for insulin, which is now shown here as a red fluorescent dye. And on the right, we've merged these two figures to produce this composite. And you can see that the red still exists, more or less exactly in the middle panel, and the green you see exactly in the left-hand panel. And you notice that they do not overlap. The colors are distinct. Now contrast that with what's happening down here in the bottom. Here are the alpha cells stained for glucagon and ACE2. On the left, ACE2, you can see here in green. In the middle, glucagon in red. This is not insulin in this instance. It's a glucagon antibody shown here in red. And on the right, you can see that the color, particularly in these areas, is yellow, showing co-localization of these two proteins in these areas and these cells within the islet. There are clearly areas where that doesn't happen, but I would suggest to you that the color in red, more or less all the time, is more orange than red, suggesting from this merge that ACE2 is present in the alpha cells that make glucagon. What Sakini and a group also showed is when you look at the delta cells that make somatostatin, shown here on the right, they would also appear to contain ACE2, whereas the PP cells that are another islet cell based on the green and red being separate, do not seem to be able to contain or do not contain PP. And I should also qualify this step by saying that this immunostaining only shows that the peptide or the protein is present in the cell. It might have been taken up from another cell. It doesn't mean it was specifically made by that cell, but certainly from her data, glucagon producing cells and somatostatin producing cells also have ACE2 in them. Now, how does this relate to more recent literature trying to do similar things in the light of the pandemic we're facing where everybody got suddenly very interested in ACE2. So here are some data now that come from a publication in Frontiers in Endocrinology, which came out, I think, in December, and which comes from a group in Europe. And it's the same principles again. Here's insulin staining in red, glucagon staining in green, and ACE2 staining with this particular monoclonal antibody in green. So in this instance, Instead of just merging two stains, they're merging three stains. And you can see the exocrine tissue here with the white nuclei, and then here is the islet. And you can clearly see blue for glucagon in the islet, red for insulin, and here is an area that stains for ACE2. And here are three insects that are shown here in greater magnification to the right of that islet. Here is the upper magnification um, inset, and you can see when one magnifies this, here is glucagon in blue, and here is ACE in green, and then the red has yellow in it, suggesting here that beta cells, in this instance, also contain ACE2. If one looks down here in the second inset, again, glucagon, the orange again, su suggesting that beta cells may contain ACE2, but not the glucagon containing cells. And here you see ACE2 staining a cell type that is not adjacent to a, beta, to a alpha cell or a beta cell. And we'll talk a little bit more about this now in a second, because this appears 
to be endothelial cells. And you see that here on the right with some staining of CD31 for endothelial cells and ACE2. And if you take yourself through the same process, here are the insets and you can see co-localization in red, green, and yellow of CD31 marking endothelial cells, ACE2 in green, and then the yellow color, suggesting that endothelial cells may actually contain ACE2, which is not an unusual finding. This has been shown by others, but here this applies to the island. Next are some data that were put together by a group of individuals, including Drs. Gonzalez and, Mar and Almanca at your institution, looking at ACE2 and that protease, Tempris 2, and their localization within pancreas and particularly islets. ACE2 in red, Tempris 2 now in green, and here you see the merge. What distinguishes the upper panels from the lower panel is that here you can see that the upper panel are stained for insulin, looking at beta cells in addition to ACE2 and Tempris 2. And the lower panel, glucagon, is now being looked at for co-localization with ACE2 and Tempris 2. And you can see clearly in these islets, there's ACE2 as well as outside the islet. Tempris 2 does not seem to be that frequent, though you can, there are some dots here within the islet suggesting there may be some inside the islet but you can clearly see it outside in the exocrine tissue. And here you see the merge of these looking at insulin in blue and at the bottom glucagon in blue. And you do not see anything that would truly suggest that there's a merge. And when one then takes these insets and looks at, look, if we look first at the islet, you can see that the blue for insulin and the red for ACE2 and the green for Tempris2 do not co-localize. And the same for glucagon with ACE2 and Tempris2. Here, looking at exocrine tissue, you can see that the duct seems to stain for ACE2, both in this particular section here, as well as in this section over here. So again, suggesting that ACE2 is not so much in endocrine cells from these data, but in other cells within the pancreas. Further, if you now do the same thing in individuals with type 2 diabetes, the previous one being in a healthy individual, there's no difference in the findings. And then if you look at an individual with type 1 diabetes, their islets are smaller, but again, the findings are similar. In other words, ACE2 and Tempris2 do not seem to co-localize in beta cells and alpha cells based on these data. Now, a paper that appeared simultaneously with this one, which came from another consortium um, in the US, made some other interesting observations that I will share with you in the next three slides before we start to move slowly on to look at medications. So here you see data also that have looked at, oh, oh sorry, I take this back. This is the last slide from the study I've just been showing you where we're now looking at specifically parasites stained with an immunostain PG for PDGF receptor beta or NG2, this particular stain probably being more specific for, for parasites, stained again in green with ACE2 and then the merge. And you can see here in yellow in this upper panel using PGF, PGGFR beta, and in the lower panel using NG2 along with the insets, that it would appear that ACE2 protein is present in parasites in the islet that are basically cells associated with the endothelial cell. Again, in keeping with a non-endocrine cell type per se having ACE2. And when this is quantified, as you see up here on the right, you can see that ACE2 co-localizes with NG2 as well as PDGF receptor beta. It seems to be higher in individuals who are older, both for PDGF R beta as well as for NG2, suggesting that aging may actually have more ACE2 present based on these data in pericytes. Now the data here are sort of interesting and like I mentioned, I wanted to show you some data from another consortium because they fit very nicely with the data from this other group. In this particular study, they've also been asked to show here the age of individuals and the BMI. And I say this asked on purpose because if you go back and look at this paper, when it was put on BioArchive, which is this pre-peer review site, some of what was in this paper and many papers that go through this process was not present. And the peer review gets people to remove stuff and add stuff that we believe in the long run produces a better publication. 
So in this instance, these data have been added, and you can see when one looks at age groups on the left as defined here in the middle, younger people being low in numbers, and the age group 51 to 72 being higher, you can see that there's a suggestion that there's more ACE2 in the pancreas in individuals who are middle age or older than in the younger individuals. And if you look on the right, you can see that with increasing BMI, there's an increase in the percentage of total pancreatic area that contains ACE2, suggesting that aging is associated with more ACE2 expression in the pancreas and may explain, therefore, why we may be seeing more SARS-CoV-2 uptake into certain cells within the pancreas. These, these, these investigators also did immunostaining here in contrast to the previous paper, looking at three patients who actually had COVID-19 and had sadly died and immunostated them for ACE2 in brown, insulin in pink and glucagon in green. And you can clearly see there's intense staining for ACE2 in these individuals in two different sections, but a lot of this is in the exocrine tissue. And in the endocrine tissue, it seems to be in the form of what may be blood vessels that go throughout the islet. Further, if one actually then stains for the virus itself, the nucleocapsid protein, and you can see here from these figures and these insects that they see the protein largely outside the islet related primarily to ductal cells. So I would say to you at the end of all of this, what I believe we can conclude is that the endothelial cell and its associated parasite likely express ACE2 and may get infected by the islet. It occurs in the duct and may therefore have some ACE2 occurs in the duct and therefore may result in um, virus entry there. But in the islet, I think it's much more debatable. But why is this all very interesting? And one of the reasons why this is interesting is because of the concept that at the level of the cell and particularly endothelium and the parasite, infection by the virus through ACE2 results in a dysfunctional injured endothelium. And this is very relevant from the point of view that we see thromboembolic phenomena with this disease in individuals who would not know necessarily to have had uh, a deep vein for thrombosis, for example, on autopsy, many of them have thrombus in their lungs. It creates a pro-inflammatory state the cells become permeable, and you finish up with oxidative stress, vasoconstriction, and ultimately cell death. And so this could have an effect on what occurs in individuals with diabetes. Now, what also we know, and we've heard about a lot, is that this endothelial infection results in what's called a cytokine storm. Now, a lot of people have questioned whether this is um, real and contributes or not. I'm not going to pass judgment on that. But I just want to show you this particular paper that comes from a few thousand people um, in New York. And in this particular analysis, they look at 671 individuals in which they've adjusted for a variety of comorbid conditions, including diabetes. And what you can see here is they've divided these individuals into high and low based on the normal levels for these particular cytokines. And what you can appreciate when we're looking at cumulative deaths the proportion of individuals who die over a month after admission to hospital, you can see those with IL-6 levels that are greater than normal are at greater risk of dying than those individuals who have IL-8 or IL-1 beta. And similarly, TNF-alpha increase is associated with an increased risk of mortality. Now, how does this rate relate then to clinical features and outcome again in terms of this so-called cytokine storm? And if you focus first here on the four panels on the left, we're looking at survival probability, again, based on IL-6, high and low, and TNF-alpha, high and low, in terms of plasma levels. But these, in these instances, the figures represent individuals in whom the oxygen saturation is normal and those in whom it's low. And what you can appreciate from this is that those individuals with elevated cytokine levels have an increased risk of mortality, whether the oxygen saturation is normal or diminished, with the higher cytokine levels being associated with increased mortality, like I say, and it would appear in those under certain circumstances when oxygen saturation is low, the outcome is even poorer. This holds for IL-6 here in these two panels, the same for TNF-alpha on the right. 
Now, what about when we look at cytokine levels and severity of disease? Here you see moderate severity of disease based on the definitions that are in place. And here you see severe COVID-19 on the right with end organ damage. In other words, kidney problems or lung problems. And you can see again, the same pattern. Higher levels of the cytokines, be it IL-6 or TNF-alpha associated with increased mortality. And the outcome is even poorer in individuals who have severe disease. Something we clearly recognize now from all the literature we've been hearing in the patients we've treated and who have unfortunately contracted this virus and had bad outcomes. So with all that, let's turn now to think about therapeutic interventions and COVID-19 outcomes. And let me say to start with, I'm not going to focus on the traditional drugs in a major way. I will briefly touch on them at the end. I want to touch on a few medications that we commonly think about um, in people with diabetes. So let's start with this one, metformin, which is the stable um, medication used to treat people with type 2 diabetes. And this study from China is very interesting, is that they looked at individuals on admission who were on metformin versus who were not on metformin for their diabetes and looked at outcomes. And I don't want to take you through all the different numbers in here, but simply to say that what is interesting is that those individuals who experienced heart failure had a reduction in risk that was significant in terms of a poor outcome, suggesting that metformin may reduce the risk of heart failure in individuals with severe COVID-19 when they're, um, when they're uh, um, hospitalized. It does not, as you see here up at the top, produce an effect to reduce death, which ultimately would be the goal. And how can it be doing this? We go back again to this concept of cytokines. And here you see again IL-6 and TNF-alpha that I touched on before, as well as CRP and IL-2. When you look here in the different forms of the disease, all individuals, mild COVID-19 or severe COVID-19 in those with type 2 diabetes, you can see with those treated in metformin in blue or who were not on metformin in red, the fact is that these lines and confidence intervals that look at a period after admission and the level of the particular cytokine are not different, suggesting that metformin does not make a difference in reducing the cytokine CRP in individuals, whether they have mild or severe disease. Similarly, IL-6 and IL-2 to an extent do not seem to be affected. But interestingly here, whether this is of any meaning or not, TNF-alpha and metformin treatment shown here in blue for individuals with severe disease seems to be the TNF-alpha levels are lower during the course of the disease than in those who were not on metformin. An interesting observation I don't think it's any more than that, but it does raise questions. Next, let's look at one of the drugs that's used to treat diabetes, sidagliptin, one of the DPP-4 inhibitors. This drug has been used for many years around the world. It was initially discovered, interestingly, um, on the shelf at one of the large pharmaceutical companies, this class of compounds at least, because they were thought to have anti-inflammatory effects. And when you look at this paper that comes from Italy in a rather small number of individuals, you can see some of them received standard of care and others received sidagliptin as part of their treatment. And you're looking here at mortality and shown here in red is standard of care. And there's a significant reduction in the risk of dying in those individuals treated with sidagliptin. And what you see on the right is that sidagliptin produces a small but significant reduction in glucose levels. Now, whether this is meaningful again, clinically, I think can be debated for reasons that I will touch on a little bit later in terms of when we look at the literature and think about why certain people may be doing better with certain drugs versus others. And lastly, I wanted, uh, before I go there, let me show you one of the reasons that's hypothesized as to why this DPP-4 inhibitor class may be having an effect. It's similar to that concept with ACE2 that I shared with you earlier. Here you see DPP4 bound to the cell, and one of the places that this binds is the endothelial cell, which we've been focusing on a lot up till now. So that DPP4 binding to its receptor on the beta cell may also be, it's been thought, a site where COVID-19 um, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 could bind. 
But like with the ACE2, when one treats individuals with a DPP4 inhibitor, one produces a number of alternative forms of the receptor that are not bound to the cell membrane, but rather are in the circulation, which again can act as a decoy and prevent SARS-CoV-2 from binding. As you see here, the DPP4 um, inhibitor is binding to SARS-CoV-2 and preventing it from binding to the receptor on the endothelial cell. This is again hypothetical. We don't know if it's true, but it's a plausible explanation and may in explain what we see with this particular virus for people with diabetes given citagliptin. Again, caution is advised. Lastly, I wanted to talk about statins, which are a mainstay of our treatment to reduce cardiovascular disease in individuals with type 2 diabetes. Here you again see a study from China published in Cell Metabolism looking at a large number of individuals who were receiving statins at the time of diagnosis and admission to the hospital and those who weren't and looking at outcome in terms of mortality. And you can see here the statin group in blue have a reduced risk of dying, more of them survive than the group in yellow. This is all comers. In another study shown here, published in one of the American Heart Association journals, on the right, you see individuals who are not known to have diabetes. You see no protective effect of statins. And here on the left, where we're looking at mortality and not survival, so this is the inverse of the figure on the previous slide, you can see that in people with diabetes, statins appear to be associated with a reduced risk of dying. What is the answer? I don't know, because others are suggesting statins may have no beneficial effect. Let's turn now to the fourth point, which is this post-acute COVID-19 sequelae, which is what, what some at NIH have been calling, but is seeming to get much more of its name is becoming more and more long COVID. This is a very interesting and unfortunate syndrome. It's a syndrome that is being recognized more and more in people who've had the disease and following the disease, finish up having symptoms that continue on despite the fact that they've adequately cleared the virus. And when you speak to some people who've actually had COVID, they experience some of the strangest symptoms around that are persisting beyond the time of the disease. So some people that I've heard from have had symptoms of this foggy brain that in the beginning they presented to their physicians with, but without the typical symptoms of COVID. And these individuals were thought to have something different. It was not necessarily COVID. And we've come to realize now that this occurs as part of the disease and can continue for many months and who knows whether it will be years afterwards. So you see here a letter to JAMA that was sent from Bacardi et al. looking at symptoms shown here on the left in individuals when they were acutely having COVID-19. And you can see that 80% of individuals complained of fatigue, nearly three quarters dyspnea, and cough, and you can see a number of other things here ranging from rhinitis, probably conjunctivitis, headache, myalgia, and diarrhea. These symptoms are all very common and are very generalized. But when you look at individuals who've now cleared the virus and are months out, you can still appreciate that many of them, more than half, about half or more, are experiencing fatigue, close to half shortness of breath, and all these symptoms that come with COVID can continue during the follow-up period. So we really have a problem that individuals who've had the disease many asymptomatically contrast with people who've had the disease and clearly died and others who've had the disease survive and have long-term symptoms from the disease. What we don't know <clears throat> amongst the sequelae, what happens to those individuals who, for example, develop acute kidney injury during the disease because it appears that the virus, <clears throat> excuse me, can also affect the glomeruli and produce renal dysfunction. The other thing we don't know, which applies to diabetes, is that while we recognize that individuals with diabetes have a poorer outcome, and that many present to the hospital and are diagnosed with diabetes for the first time, we do not know whether this is really a component of this long COVID syndrome. My concern is that the damage that may be occurring in the islet through the endothelium which could interrupt the vascular supply to the endocrine cells without the cells themselves getting infected, could produce dysfunction that in the long run could be associated with an increased risk of developing diabetes 
in those individuals who had COVID-19 and survived it without necessarily getting diabetes or who presented for the first time with diabetes. We're going to need long-term follow-up studies to understand this better. Let's turn now, lastly, to some considerations for the future. And this is a, a potpourri of them that I'm going to share with you just to think about. So let's start off with an area that we at Medicine Grand Rounds as internists do not typically think about, and that is youth. And shown here on the slide are data that come from the SEARCH study, which is an epidemiological study looking at the prevalence of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes in adolescents and youth in our country. And what we see here is the incidence, in other words, new cases per 100,000 of the population of youth with type 1 diabetes. This will be up to the age of 18. And you see here down at the bottom the population um, types, and you can appreciate that in general, things have been fairly stable. This is the white population here. There's an in slight increase in the incidence of type 1 diabetes. And you can see here the overall population in the solid blue again. The numbers are not increasing rapidly, but they clearly are increasing from in 2003, approximately 20 to 100,000 to maybe 22 or 23 per 100,000 in 2015. Contrast that with the data on the right, which looks at type 2 diabetes. Again, here are all youth diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. You can see the number was about 9 per 100,000 in 2003. It's now close to about 13 or 14. So it's gone up about 50% in the whole population. Here are white individuals who we know get type 2 diabetes, these youth, but their prevalence and incidence is not increasing as we see in other populations. Here in this broken line are black youth and shown here in this line with, this, with, the, with the broken line and dots are, and are Native Americans or American Indians. And you can see in these two populations, in this period of about 12 years, the incidence has increased from approximately 20 to 40. It is doubled. So that if diabetes is associated with increased risk of COVID-19 and bad outcomes, I worry about what's happening to these youth. I have not seen any data on this yet, but I think it's just a matter of time till we see it. But we talked also earlier that it's not just diabetes that's the risk, it's the comorbid conditions that puts people at risk. And here's some other data that I'm going to share with you from a study called Today, which took youth with type 2 diabetes that was recently diagnosed and randomized them to treatments to try and slow disease progression. And I'm not going to get into the glucose area of it now, except to say that when these youth entered the study here at baseline, they were 14 years of age. And when the study ended, they, had be, they were just under 18. They had been followed for approximately four years. At the time they entered the study, the duration of diabetes in these kids had been eight months. Okay, so we're talking now about diabetes duration of 4.8 years for rounding, let's call it five years. At just under a year, from diagnosis, you can see that one in 10, about 11 point, or exactly 11.6% had high blood pressure. 3.3% had an elevated LDL cholesterol as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Nearly one in five had elevated triglycerides. And 6.3%, one in 16 already had microalbuminuria. When one looks over time, you can see the number of new cases of these particular conditions, coexisting conditions that occurred. So that now at the age of 18, after less than five years of diabetes, a third of these youth have hypertension, 10% have an elevated LDL cholesterol that puts them at increased risk aside from their obesity and their hypertension for cardiovascular disease. One in four have increased triglycerides and scaringly, one in six have evidence of renal dysfunction and inflammation in their kidneys, which I would suggest to you is not only a bad outcome for diabetes on its own, but may also raise potential problems that could occur with a COVID infection. Now, what, are we, what can you be looking for at new approaches to try and treat this disease? And again, because this is talk about diabetes, I'm going to focus on two that can be found in clinicaltrials.gov. This first one here is looking at the effect of the SGLT2 inhibitor dapagliflozin. This drug is now commonly used with others in its class 
to treat type 2 diabetes by increasing excretion of glucose in the urine. And the goal in this study is to give dapical flows into individuals with and without diabetes who present to a medical center and to follow them for 30 days to see if one can reduce the risk of progression and poor outcomes. And the primary outcome is a composite of respiratory decompensation, whether it could be needing oxygen, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, congestive heart failure, which is new or worsening, the need for inotropic or mechanical vasoclutor support, arrhythmias that can be fatal, and the initiation of renal replacement therapy. This study, according to clintrials.gov, should be more or less fully recruited, and we should be hearing the results of it in early spring. The concept here is that you're potentially improving with SGLT2 inhibition overall inflammation, potentially endothelial health. And it will be interesting to see if this has an added benefit besides its effect on glucose and the complications of diabetes. The other study here is using the GLP-1 receptor agonist semaglutide, which is given once a week. It's going to be given in four doses over a period of three weeks to individuals who are hospitalized with COVID-19. And the composite outcome here, again, is mortality invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation. So it's a smaller primary outcome as a composite. And it's again looking because of the potential anti-inflammatory effects of this, the effect of this particular GLP-1. Unfortunately, the way this study is described in clinicaltrials.gov, I wonder whether by the time we get the results, we will learn something interesting, but its use as a therapy will not be so advanced because the way it's set up in clinicaltrials.gov, it should not complete until the spring of 2022, by which time I hope we'll be through this pandemic. Now, let me finish with some words of caution. And the caution is directed at all of us. All of us, whether we be the lay public, whether we be politicians, and whether it be physicians. A lot of the decisions that we're making regarding this virus and its therapy are based on the scientific literature. But I would suggest to you that the quality of peer review that we're witnessing is very, very variable. Some of it is very poor. Some of the papers that finish up in that archive, buyer archive or med archive, never progress to peer review or surviving peer review and finishing up in a journal. And many journals in the rush to make literature available reduced, I would suggest to you, the level of peer review that was required to get something accepted. Many studies are retrospective. They look at, like much of what the data I shared with you today, what, look, what has happened when we look at electronic health records? What is that telling us? These are not prospective, randomized intervention trials that could really tell us about what's happening in terms of interventions. They tell us plenty about people who may die or not die related to, for example, um, cardiovascular disease. There's confounding by indication. And here, let me turn back to that sidagliptin concept and that study that I mentioned, because not necessarily that study, because I'm not sure exactly how it was done, but you could clearly see that you can have studies where in this country, your access to medications is determined by your socioeconomic status and your insurance. So those individuals who might get more expensive medications, those that are still proprietary, sidagliptin being an example, semaglutide being another, they may do better than people who don't get these drugs when they arrive in the hospital. And the conclusion from doing a retrospective analysis is, well, sidagliptin seems to be protective or semaglutide appears to be protective. But what's really happened is that those people who are socioeconomically um, doing poorer cannot afford those drugs, tend to get sicker, have bad cardiovascular disease, have a variety of other factors. And sidagliptin just happens to be part of their total portfolio because they're wealthy and can afford it, or it's not part of their portfolio, and they have all these other risk factors. So we would call this confounding by indication, and we must be careful. We mustn't ascribe a benefit to a drug just because certain people got it. Meta-analyses may count individuals more than once, and this is happening, and we need to be careful of it. And there are few or small randomized clinical trials. Shown here are two major international efforts, the recovery and solidarity studies, which are adaptive and pragmatic. And I show this only to highlight to you that we can do things in a hurry if we need to and we work together collaboratively. So here, the first protocol 
for recovery, which is a major effort in the UK and internationally, was written in March of last year. The first patient was entered just six days later. 10,000 patients had been randomized within two months. And just two weeks after that, convalescent plasma was added. So it's an adaptive trial. And you can see that on the 5th of June, having started with the first protocol on the 13th of June, it was concluded that hydroxychloroquine had no clinical benefit. The same approach has been taken here, looking on the right, using Solidarity, which is a World Health Organization approach. And then you can see that the recovery study showed here in June of 2020, the effects of dexamethasone in terms of reducing poor outcomes. So this is a design which is not traditional and it's much more adaptive and pragmatic, can be used and is useful. But what these authors also point out is that when you look at the literature, and particularly when you look at this covidtrials.org, which is COVID-19 treatments, there are over 2,000 planned drug studies, but most of them have a little bit little or no directly useful information, and we must keep that in mind. The one study that I suggest to you has produced useful information recently is this paper looking at one of the messenger RNA vaccines that was published on the 31st of December last year. This is the vaccine that's been produced with Pfizer by Pfizer and the German company, showing individuals here randomized to placebo and those individuals randomized to the active vaccine. And you can clearly see the cumulative incidence of um, COVID-19 in open squares being mild or moderate disease and in solid squares, severe disease. And you can see a marked reduction in the incidence of COVID-19 infection or disease, including or excluding one case here of severe disease. The cases tend to be a lot milder. And yet you can see from this inset is that just three weeks after the first dose, when people are typically getting their second dose, we already have 50% protection. So with that, I will end by making a plea to all of you. Given the increased mortality that we see in people with diabetes and the likelihood that people are going to get post-COVID sequelae if they survive, I would encourage you to get your patients and I would encourage you yourself to get vaccinated against this virus because in that way, I think we can convince our patients this is one way we're going to get to ending, ending this pandemic. And I hope that the year 2021 for all of you and for all of us is filled with lots of vaccinations and a better outcome so that we can eventually get rid of these masks that we're having to wear when we get to 2022. And with that, Roy, I will end and thank everybody for their attention. Dr. Khan, thank you for an absolutely outstanding and eloquent and elegant grand rounds. Um, just to comment on your last slide, we're, we're together on that. I think we gotta get the government more um, uh, facile in the distribution of the vaccine so that we can provide them to our patients as needed. I don't know what's happening in Washington state, but in Florida, it's not quite as transparent a process as it should be. Um, I, uh, I, I thank you again for this very interesting presentation. And I am interested and intrigued by what you mentioned about our youth and the increased incidence of type two diabetes and the black and American Indian populations um, even before the pandemic. So I wonder if you had any insight as to uh, what factors are playing a major role to account for that increased incidence and whether COVID-19, given the fact that when it does infect children as we've seen, has been relatively benign and if it's indeed related to the inflammatory mechanisms, they seem not to have that. So why might one hypothesize that you might not see the same uptick uh, in, in, the, in the youth and adolescents? I'll stop there and ask you for your comments. Great, so let me answer the second question first, Roy. We're seeing more and more cases in youth now of this multiple inflammatory syndrome, which is like, you know, Takahashi's disease that we've seen before. And we're seeing more and more of it. And we don't know yet, I don't think, whether there's more in those with kids with type two. So I think kids are protected. We've seen that also. I showed that data from the pancreas, at least showing that there's less um, ACE2 expression in the pancreas of youth than older people. And my guess is, and I don't know, that this may be occurring in other organ systems. But the kids are still getting 
um, diseases that the disease that is immune related, but to a lesser extent than adults. Coming back to the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes, I think there's a lot of interest in this. We do not understand yet exactly what all the factors are. Certainly, obesity is a risk factor, genes are a risk factor. How much epigenetics and the intrauterine environment plays a role also comes into play. But what we do know, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow when I give endocrine brand rounds, is that in kids, they get beta cell dysfunction and impaired insulin secretion like adults. They're also, these kids are very insulin resistant. And what we see in these kids is that over time, just over the period of a year in those who are at risk, and over the, in the today study, over four years in that group that I shared with you, the, um, the uh, complications of diabetes, we see a far greater rate of decline in beta cell function than we see in adults. Why that is, again, is a question that is open and has not been sorted out. But they have many of the risk factors the same as adults, but their disease is more aggressive, not only in the loss of beta cell function, the harder it is to control their glucose, but also, as I shared with you, their complications. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll open the floor up to questions. You can either put them in the chat or unmute yourself. We are actually at the top of the hour. So Steve, we'll be sure to get you any questions that were placed in the chat so you can answer them. And again, I, it's so great to see you. I wish we could personally uh, embrace you uh, in, in the, the Miami spirit of uh, the way we do things down here. But I thank Dr. Uh, Bernal Mizrahi for inviting you, and I thank the McKenzie family for sponsoring today's uh, Grand Rounds. Thank you, everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Bye.